what do biodiesel fuel and peanut butter have in common? How are crayons and space travel connected? What are soybeans doing in our automobiles? These marvels can all be traced back to the inventive mind of a man who was born a slave, but emerged a master of scientific discovery. He was able to just look around him and see the raw materials and then see the human need that was out there and bring the two together. And so my own personal view of Carver is that he was a master integrator. Carver had the most remarkable heart. And that's the thing I think I love the most about his life. I mean, as tremendous of a scientist as he was, um, he, coming out with so many useful products that even today, I don't even know what we would do without. Um, his heart was the best. Dr. George Washington Carver is well known throughout the world for his revolutionary research, particularly with a peanut. In the early 1900s, he discovered and developed more than 300 new uses for the legume in food products and industrial applications, from face cream to a cure for dandruff, from linoleum flooring to motor oil. Carver saw infinite possibilities in the peanut plant. He literally inspired other researchers all across this country to take a deeper look at this plant. And of course, I believe that, that the end of the line has not been reached on what he uncovered. But Carver's legacy goes far beyond his accomplishments with what was called at the time, the lowly goober. He toiled for more than 40 years in his laboratory at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama and is credited with countless breakthroughs in agricultural research. The impact of that was just astonishing. Carver, through the kind of research he did, was able to really lead the revitalization, really, of a whole region, the southern region. He really is one of the great American heroes. If there's anyone you're going to learn about, you should learn about, you know, Carver would be one of those people. George Carver was born into slavery in 1864 in Diamond Grove, Missouri. He was the property of Moses Carver. Towards the end of the Civil War, Southern bushwhackers raided the Carver's farm and kidnapped baby George and his mother. Moses Carver hired a Union scout named John Bentley to trace after them and try to recover his property. Bentley was able to find baby George and the mother Mary was never seen again. We do not know what happened. George was near death when he was found. Moses and his wife took care of him like he was their own child. Too frail to work in the fields, he helped out with the household chores. It was on this farm that he had spare time to go out and wander in the woods and enjoy nature and become very close to nature he would look at a briar he would look at the soil he would look at the different leaf patterns and question and question and wonder and ask why why are things like this george was inspired to paint after visiting a neighbor's home and seeing works of art for the first time so he came back created his own brushes with twigs and he would take nature's berries and grasses and create colors, an array of colors, and begin to paint. Young George Carver's inventiveness and hunger for learning compelled him to seek what was impossible for many African Americans of his day, a formal education. Around the age of 11, he left the Carver farm and walked 10 miles to Neosho, Missouri determined to attend classes at the Lincoln School for Negro Children. He worked for his room and board at the home of Mariah and Andrew Watkins, who lived next door to the school. The story is that at lunch hour, he would jump the fence between the school and Aunt Mariah's house and go over and help her with her laundry. Many years later, George was inspired to draw this picture of the school and the Watkins house. George studied hard and got his high school diploma. He applied to Highland College in Kansas and was accepted. It was a big moment. 
Then he went to Highland and he showed up and they said, we didn't know you were black. And they turned him away. It was a huge disappointment. George didn't give up. In his mid-twenties, he applied to Simpson College in Iowa, where blacks were allowed. He was accepted and began taking classes in painting. His first love was art, and he had a teacher whose name was Etta Budd. She was very dubious about whether a black could make it in art. It was a near impossibility. And she was a little concerned about him being he was, he was not the first black at Simpson, but he was the only one at the time. Carver's complex understanding of nature came through in his paintings and drawings at Simpson. Etta Bud noticed this talent and encouraged him to change his course of study to horticulture. Carver took her advice and transferred to the Iowa State College of Agriculture in Ames, where he became the first black student. And he had some trouble with dining room privileges and other things. But he overcame them by his knowledge, which was so conspicuously immense that you didn't have to be in his presence very long to realize that this man knew things. When Carver completed his bachelor's degree, Iowa State officials offered him a teaching position. The first black student in the college's history was now its first African-American professor. Though Carver was content at Iowa State, in April 1896, he was offered an opportunity that would change his life forever. Booker T. Washington, a leader among the newly freed slave population in the South, invited him to come to Tuskegee Institute, an all-black college in Alabama. When Booker T. became aware of Carver, that there was an agricultural expert in the country, anywhere, who was black, that was huge. He was really the only one in the whole country. Booker T. badly wanted someone like that. At the age of 31, George Washington Carver had found his true calling. He went to Alabama with a mission to help a once enslaved population find its way to self-sufficiency. Little did he know 